when we talk about something, are we talking about the same thing or are we all having these little bubbles in our heads saying, oh, it, it looks like they might be talking about this. Welcome to How AI Happens, a podcast where experts explain their work at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence. You'll hear from AI researchers, data scientists, and machine learning engineers as they get technical about the most exciting developments in their field and the challenges they're facing along the way. I'm your host, Rob Stevenson, and we're about to learn how AI happens. Several installments of this podcast have touched on the multifaceted role of the AI practitioner. How it's not enough for them to be a talented coder or an accomplished academic with loads of papers to their name. Rather, the modern AI practitioner needs to also display a deep understanding of the individual their technology seeks to assist. Priyanka Roy, a data and AI solutions specialist with Microsoft, is someone who understands this need and cultivates it within the AI building teams she consults. Priyanka refers to it as design thinking, and as she explains, it is a crucial approach in developing any meaningful AI technology. Priyanka joined to discuss the importance of design thinking and how it applies to rigorous data governance. Priyanka, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? Hey, thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me. I'm so pleased to have you. You are on the exact opposite side of the globe. I don't think we could be further away from each other if we tried. That's right. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in from all the way in New Zealand. Thank you. That's that's the world we live in, right, Rob? Uh, it's so flat. You 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 probably found me somewhere on the on the interweb, and here we are exchanging notes. It is figuratively flat. There's a whole whole sub genre of YouTube dedicated <laughs> to the world being actually flat, but this is not what we're going to be covering here. <laughs> But I am so excited to have you on, Priyanka. I have so many questions for you. I guess before we get too deep in the weeds, would you mind sharing a little bit about your background and then your current role at Microsoft? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I live in Wellington, New Zealand, and um, I currently work at Microsoft about nine months into my role as a data and AI uh, solution specialist. And what, what that means is I basically have a set of customers in the finance, banking, insurance, and also a mixed bag of construction and healthcare industry, where um, I'm responsible for, uh, for, for getting in touch with them and understanding uh, what sort of problems they're currently dealing with. And these problems don't have to be data-related problems. It could be any industry challenges, any business challenges that they're currently facing. And then coming together with my team and our Microsoft partners to help uh, come up with a solution that will help help the customer move forward. And a bit about my background. Uh, so before Microsoft, I've got about 16 years experience in the data and AI industry. It wasn't called AI when I started. It was data and warehousing when I started back in 2005. I've worked mostly in consulting companies, the likes of, uh, of Wipro, Capgemini, Deloitte. Uh, so that kind of gives me a good understanding of various business sectors and uh, makes me right for, for the current role that I do. It's interesting to me that you get this access into a lot of companies who are sort of mulling over, hemming and hawing how they might apply AI into their businesses. What are some of the common challenges that these folks are facing? And where do you come in to be like, hey, maybe you could be looking at these sort of solutions? Mm -hmm. in, in the past few years, what I've noticed, or in the, even in, in, in the pandemic times that we live in, a lot of focus is that most of these companies are uh, giving on is is customer experience. So how do they how do they ensure that uh, their customers are retained or customers come back to where they left pre pandemic? An example of banking: um, how do they make their customer touch points uh, current to to these times that we live in? How do we ensure that we know a customer much better than than we knew before? Um, so making customer experience the best and top notch is is one of the things or trends that I'm um, I come across quite often. Um, also in, in the banking space, uh, there is a great um, focus on fraud, and fraud uh, fraud analytics is is also a big uh, big focus. So this is just one or two of them that I've mentioned. But um, in the manufacturing industry, for example, it's all about um, how do we prevent a machine outages from happening. So, for example, an airline, um, you know, 
every time an airline has to has to stop uh, operating ad hoc so much loss to the company and to the brand so how do you ensure that um, that can be monitored proactively and and you know the brand is maintained uh, customer experience is maintained because you're on time wherever you have to be at the the outset of this project or campaign that these customers would end up going on it strikes me that they would need to be very deliberate about what exactly the outcome is they want and that's something that i'm hearing from folks more and more is you can have the most fantastic fantastically complex algorithm on the planet but if you're not asking the right question then you're not getting the right response or useful response is part of your role to help be consultative with these companies to make sure that they are approaching these problems in the correct way and asking the right questions of the technology? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this took me a while to understand. Um, the reason I'm saying this is years ago when I would meet customers, they already came to us with a problem and and they also had a solution in mind that this is, a, look, this is the problem. And I think this is, this is the solution that we want. And can you just help us um, uh, build the solution out, implement it, and maybe even, even train us to, uh, to use it. But the problems of today are quite unknown. The idea here is for people like me to actually challenge the customer and ask further questions, be curious about why exactly are they, are they thinking what they're thinking why are they why do they think that this is the problem has someone actually just asked them to do this or uh, have they spent time with with their customers understanding if this is a real challenge and this is the toughest thing to do just because uh, when you're meeting a customer for the first time you pro- you always want to have a, a good relationship and you just don't want to go and challenge them and saying hey your thinking is wrong so it, it takes time to first build trust with the customer uh, for them to even um, let you ask such questions to them, right? It's it's almost how human relationships play out. You don't just take advice from a stranger. You want to understand who that person is and why they're saying what they're saying, and you know they have their, a good intention in mind. Um, so so that's that's the the challenge. Um, it's about discovering and un- uncovering the problem rather than jumping straight to the solution. You probably have a sense of what are some of these sort of probing questions that you can ask that will reveal someone's approach to you. I'm curious, in the cases where maybe someone hasn't been as thoughtful, their approach isn't as examined, what do their answers to your questions typically look like? What's sort of like the giveaway that maybe you haven't thought as deeply about whether this technology is right for you? Yeah, so uh, the first giveaway is usually when it's just one person who is speaking to you and maybe that person is coming from uh, their own business area and problems of today is don't just lie in one business area. You have these problems kind of preside in different different areas of the business and that's when you try. I try and bring multiple people into the room, uh, people from different business units who think there is a common problem. Um, and and I'll, I'll get to the point where some of the techniques that, that we use um, to, to get to this, uh, and we call it design thinking techniques. Um, uh, now, you probably know of design thinking, but, but for our listeners, it's basically a way of um, discovering or uncovering the problem rather than jumping to the solution. And it's, it's a very... Uh, I'd say a human-centered approach. Let's say it's a student um, organization. It's it's a university, and we're trying to design a solution for them uh, where it's easier for them to apply to apply to the institution, and then uh, maybe even uh, do some blended learning on it, uh, both online and on campus, and then finally take them through their whole um, whole student journey uh, until the point where they graduate. Imagine just sitting sitting here in a room or in a meeting room with, with a fancy whiteboard and just building a solution for them without even um, speaking to the students um, about what they want. Do they even have a problem with, with uh, what currently exists? Um, have you gone and, gone and um, looked out what a student of today looks like? Uh, who are they? What they aspire to do? What are their behaviors? What are they thinking, feeling, doing whenever they are interacting with uh, any institution? Do they need a certain sort of sort of help, motivation, things like that? So that's when you create these personas of of what an I what a prospective student could look like, 
when they when they are interacting with uh, with the university and then you go and interview them and ask them questions and uh, get into their thought process and of that comes uh, a few personas and that's when you start um, actually thinking about them uh, from a human perspective and and then you come back and then you come to your uh, to your uh, group of people maybe even bring them uh, a few of them into the room when you're brainstorming and brainstorming ideas on how you could solve them i mean you, you'd notice here that what i'm trying to do here is uh, getting to know the end user more than just um, throwing a solution at them so that's where design thinking comes into play it's so important because it's not enough for the AI practitioner to be exceptionally good at, at building algorithms or tweaking a model. The more I learn about this field, the more it feels as though the individuals building these tools need to always be thinking about what it's going to look like in the hands of the user, right? It's not enough to be like, oh, that's not my department. You know, I, I just uh, maybe individuals who are more in a more academic um, area or in a more mm -hmm. research-based approach to AI uh, can get away with that. But if you're building a product, then you really do need to have an intimate understanding of how this will impact people. Is that kind of uh, how you view the the typical AI practitioner? How, how can design thinking really be helpful to them? Yes. Yeah, so for typical AI practitioner, and I call myself a data and AI practitioner because um, I feel there is no AI without the right data. So um, for a data and AI practitioner, it's building good models and algorithms and having the right ML code is is important because um, that's that's the real um, thing that makes enables good experiences. But getting to know the end end user or the end customer who's going to benefit from such experiences is really important um, yes yeah, so getting into the into the mindset of of the end user and often what happens is the teams that design solutions and the team that builds the solution is quite different so someone just gets the specs and they start building and they never speak to the the, the person who thought about the solution and why the solution was needed so it's really important um, for these teams to come together and and think creatively and co collaboratively about the problem and i see this happening um, a lot more in the past few years uh, i've noticed that design thinking techniques have seeped well into the into various areas of of business um, so i live in wellington here uh, so we have a lot of public sector organizations here and I've noticed that most of the public sector companies here, uh, so let's say um, if we have to apply for a passport, these companies are actually looking at the end user. So where is this person coming from? Who is the who is the citizen or who is the who is the customer? Where do they come from? What sort of challenges could they face um, if they're applying for a passport? Are they are they from New Zealand? Do they understand English or are they someone who immigrated here? Do they need any language um, help when they apply for things? Uh, what are they using uh, to apply? Are they doing it online or are they going to um, a passport office to do this? There's so many things and they get, gather data about all this. And that's when and only after that do they come together to uh, to solve or, or build a solution? So I'm seeing a lot of that happening and, and, and that's quite refreshing. It's also very common amongst AI practitioners to think of their work in terms of impact and scale, right? With software, you can impact potentially the whole world, anyone with internet access, right? Uh, and if that's your goal, then you simply can't afford not to employ this approach when you are thinking about the people you want to impact and how these products are going to wind up in their hands, exactly. right? Exactly, yeah. I like how you said a moment ago that there is no AI without data. And the importance of data is is well-tilled AI blog soil and AI podcast soil, <laughs> but it's that's because it's so important. And you hear individuals talk about, oh, well, it's not just data, you need quality data. And for, you have to have data that's uh, clean and that you have to have good data hygiene. And your approach to all of this, I was really interested to learn about because you kind of put an umbrella over all of it and call it data governance. Yeah. And so I would just love to hear your sort of more far reaching approach to data with a capital D <laughs> as, as it as it is applied to building AI technologies, not just in the acquisition of that data, not just in in the utilization of it, but in every facet of making it work for you. Correct. Okay. Yes, of course, data is an important part of AI. 
I hear this often in New Zealand, BI before AI, so meaning business intelligence before artificial intelligence. The reason, the reason people say that is most organizations over here, um, at least, are struggling with quality data. It's usually an afterthought. So now coming to data governance, data governance in a, in a, in a nutshell would mean how does an organization get its data and keep its data right? so that it can be used in the right fashion across the organization. For organization employees to make decisions, it's important for them to trust their data. And how exactly are they going to trust their data? It on, that can only happen if uh, the data quality is maintained. If you go and speak within an organization, the organization lang- the language is different in different parts of the business. In in one area, a passenger, let's say you're in a transport organization, you speak to one part of the business, their definition of a passenger would be different uh, if you go and speak in various areas of the business, right? So uh, having a common uh, glossary of terms within the organization, we call it the data dictionary. That's really important. So when we talk about something, are we talking about the same thing or are we all having these little bubbles in our uh, in our heads saying, oh, it, it looks like they might be talking about this and getting the glossary right, getting the lingo right, that's really important. If you want to get your data governance right, you need to start thinking about people, process and platform all in unison. So you want to understand that people understand data, they trust it. They are data literate and they reach out to facts when there is a need to answer a question. So that's the people aspect. The process is when, um, so within a business, there are various various systems that store data, right? So you have product data, you've got supplier data, you've got uh, location, you've got uh, various things. So, and all these systems are managed by different areas of the business. So we need to find custodians within the business who look after this. Um, whenever something new comes in, they need to be the authority saying that, okay, I manage the supplier data and I can fully guarantee that uh, we've got good processes and checks in place that ensures that the quality of this data, this data is complete and you can trust it. So imagine if every area of the business does that, uh, how good the quality and decision making of that business will become. Right. And then finally, you need a platform. So you need a, a platform, meaning a meaning technology where all of this can be stored. Um, and in my case, because I'm Microsoft, I'm talking about Microsoft Azure, where um, you have a common data platform where you're storing all this, all these uh, records. And then finally, people are um, building data warehouses and then even machine learning on top of it to report on it. So, yeah, so you can see how a good foundation can help. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What do you think are some of the pitfalls of not approaching your data strategy in this way? What are what's some of the uh, the things that can go wrong if you aren't deliberate about your data governance strategy? Yeah, so what what will happen is it's like establishing a or building a house. You've probably got a vision of a, a beautiful house, but imagine if your um, foundation is not right. What may happen is that, uh, let's say there's this turmoil, there's, uh, there's a cyclone or something, any any natural calamity, the house might just topple down, yeah, just because your foundation wasn't right. So initially, it might all look okay. Um, in an organization, you, you might... Uh, you might start a project um, on AI, let's say, and um, you do a little pilot, uh, a proof of concept, and you get what you're after, and off you go. You, you, you're making decisions. But for the organization to change completely, you want this technology to be adopted, this particular AI technology to, to be adopted. How do you ensure that everyone in the organization is on board? Um, and that will happen only when you take them all together in your in your little spacecraft, right? You um, you want to ensure that their systems, their data systems, are also nicely curated. They are taken care of. The health is maintained, and only then can everyone start exploring um, and building good AI uh, models and maybe even projects on on top of that. Yeah. So it, think of it as a as a house, and and the fact that you want to lay a solid foundation so that you can keep building. What part does thick data have to play within a well-ordered data governance strategy? Yeah, so 
Thick data. So this was a term I just came across maybe a few years ago. I, I only came, I knew of big data and I knew of small data and then, then there was thick data. So, um, so basically thick data is, um, is data that adds context and meaning to, to numbers. So when you, when you think about big data, it's, it's basically any data that comes at a high volume. It's, it's, uh, at, Good velocity. There's variety in it. It's unstructured, and structured, or semi-structured, but it's just numbers. Yeah, so you don't really know uh, what those numbers mean. Uh, what is it about? What, the, what are those numbers about? Is it about people? Is it about where is it coming from? So only when you add context and uh, context to those numbers does it become holistic. You know, so you can't just rely on numbers. You need to understand. Uh, what's behind it? So if it's about a person, what what was the background of the person? Where is it coming from? What what is the person doing when when this data was captured? Otherwise, it's it's very um, skewed. Um, and I think uh, I read a, an article once uh, about how Netflix um, is able to understand what people like to watch. Uh, so for example. Um, so let's say people are watching a particular uh, title and they're, they're they're going through it. They also want to understand what are people who are they watching it with, uh, what are they having while uh, while watching the movie? Uh, are they having popcorn or are they having a wine or and things like that? So just to make the whole experience a lot more richer. So imagine, I mean, it's it's not like they 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 want to. Um, spy and look at what you're doing but imagine if they gather data uh, by asking us so when you were watching this particular title what were you what, what were you watching or who are you watching it with um and what do you prefer to eat so maybe they they're wanting to build a, a richer customer experience uh, maybe by offering such things uh, in the future so so um yeah so think of thick data as just context to whatever uh, we're talking just, just more language to it rather than mathematics but it's 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 something that again adds into the concept of design thinking. It's it's again going back to the end user and trying to understand them a bit more, and not just treating them as a number, but more as a as a human who with uh, needs and wants, and uh, and then building things around that. Yeah, it's so interesting because my first thought was, oh well, this is this is qualitative data. This is more maybe more anecdotal. It's more. Uh, more contextual, but the whole point of building these fantastically complicated models is that they can sometimes see patterns where we don't. Mm -hmm. And so, whereas if you're, you're watching a television show, you're having a Sprite versus a glass of red wine, I might not think that matters, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. But it may, it may matter. And we would never know unless you feed it, unless you append that data onto you're watching, you're, you're viewing data and start to view it or run it through a much more powerful, powerful algorithm. Exactly. Yeah. You never know. We, we, someone must have um, already done something and we probably will experience the benefits of it soon. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Who knows? Well, uh, Priyanka, this has been such a delight chatting with you today. I've learned so much from you and your background is just so rich and uh, with expertise. And I love learning all about data governance and your own of you to design thinking. It's been fascinating chatting with you today. So thank you so much for being a part of the podcast. Thank you, Rob. And thanks for finding me somewhere on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, the, in the big flat world we live in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How AI Happens is brought to you by Sama. Sama provides accurate data for ambitious AI, specializing in image, video, and sensor data annotation and validation for machine learning algorithms in industries such as transportation, retail, e-commerce, media, medtech, robotics, and agriculture. For more information, head to Sama.com.